Hey, Southern Gothic fans. Join us online now at southerngothicmedia.com. There you can find podcast updates, links to our social media, and subscription access to our new members-only series, Southern Gothic, The Monsters, narrated by me, Brittany Schacksnyder. On April 14, 1865, at approximately 10.30 p.m., actor John Wilkes Booth shot President Abraham Lincoln with the Derringer pistol as he and his wife attended a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Upon hearing this shot, and seeing the president instantly slump forward in his seat from the direct blow to the rear of his head. Lincoln's guest, Major Henry Rathbone, lunged for the assassin. A brief struggle ensued, but Booth escaped and jumped from the presidential viewing box onto the stage of Ford's Theater, 12 feet below. Some claimed he then yelled six Semper Tyrannus to the audience, a reference to Caesar's assassin's own words, Latin, for thus always to tyrants. Others claim he merely boasted, the South is avenged. But Booth's escape was not without personal harm. His leg was injured and possibly even broken as he fled the scene forcing him to direct his escape to a small farm in Maryland where he knew a sympathetic doctor lived. A doctor who would attend to his injury, personally opening himself to punishment for abetting the assassin. Punishment that would land him thousands of miles away from his home, imprisoned in a coastal fortress on a lonely, isolated island that many have since called America's very own Devil's Island. My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. When Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon came to America in 1513 on the first European expedition of Florida, he stumbled upon a series of small islands just west of the Florida Keys, right on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, south of mainland Florida. De Leon, who had landed on the eastern coast of the peninsula, claiming it for Spain before venturing south, was impressed by the thousands of sea turtles that inhabited the islands, and thus named the stretch Las Tortugas. Unlike the British, the Spanish had no interest in agriculture, and further exploration of Florida proved the territory had no silver. So the new colony soon served primarily as a staging area for the Spanish utilizing the Gulf Stream to reach their more profitable territories in the West. The nearby waterway would eventually become one of the world's most prosperous shipping channels. And with Florida, Spain controlled the opening of the Gulf of Mexico to the Western Caribbean and Atlantic Ocean. A 
aside from a brief period of British rule following the French Indian War, Florida remained under Spanish governorship for almost three centuries till 1821, when they'd finally sell the land to the United States in exchange for it to renounce its claims in Texas. Within five years' time, the islands, now known as the Dry Tortugas, were being inspected by the United States Navy to possibly become the home of a new naval station. Unfortunately, this interest in the islands would set a chain of events into motion that would eventually turn the Tortugas into the home of America's very own Devil's Island. For centuries, piracy was an issue in the waters surrounding Florida, especially the narrow straits parallel to the Keys, where pirates were able to prey on merchant vessels as they bottlenecked into the mouth of the Mississippi. Of course, as trade increased, the problem only became more rampant. Now, in possession of the territory, the United States hoped to put an end to the ongoing issue. So in December of 1824, U.S. Navy Commodore David Porter headed to the Florida Keys in search of a location to build the naval base. Plans had already begun to erect what would become Fort Zachary Taylor on Key West itself. So Porter focused on the dry Tortugas as a possible home for the new installation, but he quickly dismissed it due to its shallow waters, lack of fresh water, and a sandy foundation that he believed would make it difficult to build a fortification on. So in 1825, the government built a lighthouse instead on what is now known as Garden Key. But interest in fortifying the Tortugas did not waver. And only five years later, the new naval commodore, John Rogers, saw opportunity where Commodore Porter had not. This small strip of islands that make up the dry Tortugas, some of which are hardly more than sandbars, rise up sharply from relatively deep water, creating a natural harbor for a large number of ships to anchor safely. And Porter believed that fortifying this harbor would give America the strategic advantage to defend the entire Gulf Coast and put a stop to the rampant piracy. So construction of Fort Jefferson The 50-foot brick walls were designed in a six-sided hexagonal shape covering over 16 acres of land, surrounding the original Garden Key Lighthouse and covering the vast majority of the island. 16 million bricks were shipped in to build the fortification, whose massive ramparts would be impregnable to assault. 420 heavy guns were planned to be distributed throughout the two-tiered casemates. A moat was built around the massive structure as well, 14 feet wide and two foot deep, preventing vessels from direct contact with the outer walls of the fort. And inside these walls were 13 acres of parade grounds, a hospital, headquarters, and enough barracks to support 1,500 servicemen. Civilian carpenters and masons were brought in to help with Fort Jefferson's construction, but the bulk of the labor fell squarely on the backs of slaves.
This was the most ambitious fortification project ever undertaken on American soil. But once war broke out, this unfinished naval base would become a prison. In spite of Florida's secession from the United States at the outset of the Civil War, Fort Jefferson remained in Union hands. So in September of 1861, President Lincoln began using a sentence of hard labor at Fort Jefferson as punishment for deserters in lieu of execution. Within three years, 214 convicted soldiers were imprisoned on the island, a number that would quadruple before the war's end peaking at 882 prisoners, guarded by only 583 soldiers. Then, on July 24, 1865, Fort Jefferson's most infamous civilian prisoners would arrive. Samuel Mudd was born on December 20th, 1833, in Charles County, Maryland. He attended Georgetown University in Washington and received a medical degree from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Mudd then returned to Charles County to practice medicine, as well as marry his childhood sweetheart, Sarah Frances Dyer. The young doctor's father, Henry, a tobacco farmer, gifted the new couple 218 acres of his best farmland, as well as a beautiful new two-story farmhouse named St. Catherine. To supplement his income, Dr. Mudd would continue farming this land, which had been in his family since the 1690s. And he and his wife, Sarah, began starting a family of their own. They would have four children over the following years, but less than a decade after the pair would marry, their lives would change dramatically when John Wilkes Booth infamously arrived on St. Catherine's doorstep seeking medical assistance only hours after assassinating President Abraham Lincoln. Assistance that would tear Dr. Mudd's family apart and land him in a military prison over a thousand miles away from his home. There's much controversy over Dr. Samuel Mudd's actual involvement in the plot to kill President Lincoln, but it is fairly well documented that Dr. Mudd was in fact an outspoken advocate for both slavery and the Confederate cause. Not only was the family's tobacco business built on the exploitative practice, but Mudd like far too many of his contemporaries, wholeheartedly believed that slavery itself was divinely ordained. So in 1864, when his home state of Maryland abolished the practice, freeing the state's slave population and upending the local farming economy, Mudd considered selling his tobacco fields and relying entirely on his medical practice for income. It's 
It's at this time when Dr. Samuel Mudd first met 26-year-old actor John Wilkes Booth, who under the guise of a real estate search in nearby Bryantown, was actually scouting out an escape route and searching for co-conspirators in his scheme to kidnap the Union president and ransom him for the release of thousands of Confederate prisoners of war. Many believe it was this meeting when Booth convinced the angry and bitter Dr. Samuel Mudd to assist him. They met on Sunday, November 13th, 1864, at St. Mary's Church, only about 25 miles from the nation's capital and five months prior to the fateful assassination. Mudd then invited Booth to visit St. Catherine the following day and stay the night at his family's home before he headed back to Washington, where the pair would reconvene only a few weeks later at the National Hotel. The circumstances surrounding this subsequent meeting is what would eventually play a major role in Dr. Mudd's conviction. Booth and Mudd had been joined that night by two men. John Surratt, a Confederate Secret Service courier and spy, and his longtime friend Louis Weichmann, who unfortunately for the others would become one of the primary witnesses for the prosecution of these conspirators after Lincoln's death. Yet historians are divided as to Mudd's involvement in the conspiracy, believing that while he was certainly sympathetic to Booth's cause, in actuality, he was merely there to introduce the actor to Surratt without any actual knowledge of the plot. Either way, the Confederate spy agreed to assist Booth and on March 17, 1865, they, along with several others, made a thwarted attempt at ambushing Lincoln's carriage outside of Washington. The following month, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to the Commanding General of the United States Army and the Civil War had come to a close. But John Wilkes Booth still believed that he himself could personally save the Confederate cause. On April 15, 1865, Dr. Samuel Mudd and his wife Sarah were awoken by a supposedly unexpected knocking on their door at 4 a.m. There on his doorstep, he found Booth and his accomplice David Harold in disguise. Mudd would later claim he did not recognize the pair, who were going by the names Tyson and Henston. However, the doctor assisted the assassin with the leg he had broken while trying to escape after shooting President Lincoln only hours before. The men stayed until the following afternoon, paying Mud $25 for his assistance, before heading off into Virginia, where they believed they would be heralded for their accomplishment. Dr. Mudd later claimed he was completely unaware that the president had been murdered when the men showed up at his doorstep and even waited till the day after the convicts had left to contact the authorities. Thus, drawing a significant amount of scrutiny his way. So within two weeks, he was arrested by the United States government, charged with both conspiracy and harboring the assassins during their escape. A nine-man military commission tried the doctor 
alongside seven other suspected co-conspirators, ruling on June 29, 1865, that Dr. Samuel Mudd was guilty. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, missing the death penalty by only one vote. On July 17, 1865, Dr. Samuel Mudd, Edmund Spangler, Samuel Arnold, and Michael O'Laughlin, the four convicted co-conspirators to escape the death penalty, were taken from their temporary cells in Washington, D.C., in irons, and brought to the nearby Potomac River, where they boarded a United States military steamer, headed to a destination of which they were completely unaware. One week later, they arrived at Fort Jefferson, Conditions at Fort Jefferson were so brutal that many of the prisoners considered their imprisonment there a death sentence. These men labored through the boiling sun, vicious mosquitoes, and frequent sandstorms without respite. They were tasked with everything from the construction of barracks and powder magazines to the excavation of the seawater moat, as well as masonry repair and the hoisting of the United States Army's immense cannons into their positions. Empty casemates served as open-air cells for prisoners, and Mudd, Spangler, Arnold, and O'Laughlin were quartered in the second-tier room directly above the main entrance of the structure giving the men full visibility of the fort's comings and goings. It's with this knowledge, they soon made an attempt to escape the hardship by trying to stow away on a supply ship only two months after their arrival. But they were quickly caught, and in punishment, Mud and the others were sent to live in what was aptly named the Dungeon. Conditions in this dank first floor cell were so abysmal that a line from Dante's Inferno was hung over the entrance way. Whoso entereth here leaveth all hope behind. The men ended up spending three months there. Kept in leg irons and placed under a round-the-clock guard, continuing to work 12-hour days, but now constantly shackled. Unfortunately for Dr. Mudd, the worst days of his imprisonment were still very much in his future. In August of 1867, a yellow fever epidemic struck Fort Jefferson. The islands, once named Las Tortugas by Ponce de Leon, had earned the addition of dry to its name by sailors and pirates who landed here over the years as a reference to its lack of fresh water. So in order to sustain itself, a system of both cisterns to collect rainwater and steam condensers to desalinate seawater were installed in the fort, but the fresh water was stored in open barrels, making it a particularly fertile breeding ground amidst the humid, tropical climate. Mudd described the miserable outcome in a letter to his wife, Sarah. I'm nearly worn out. The weather is almost suffocating me, and millions of mosquitoes, fleas, and bedbugs infest the whole island. 
We can't rest day or night in peace for the mosquitoes. As a result, yellow fever, an often fatal viral disease, emerged. The affliction, caused from the bite of an infected female mosquito, results in extreme fever, chills, muscle pains, delirium, and severe headaches to its victims. Fortunately, since the close of the Civil War, the prison population had declined dramatically to only about 50 prisoners still on the island when the first case appeared on August 18th. Unfortunately, hundreds of officers and soldiers were still stationed there, and the fever was rapidly spreading through their ranks as well. Joseph Sim Smith, Fort Jefferson's physician and surgeon, attempted to combat the fast-moving epidemic, but within two weeks, he himself contracted the fever, perishing only three days later. So Dr. Samuel Mudd volunteered to take over in his place, and by October 1st, nearly all the fort's inhabitants had become infected. In spite of his continued resentment toward those who had imprisoned him there, Mudd worked tirelessly to save the men under his care, and as a result, only 38 lives were lost out of 270 reported cases. Half of the mortality rate seen in other yellow fever outbreaks at the time. In gratitude, Lieutenant Edmund L. Zielinski, a survivor of the fever due to Dr. Mudd's efforts, petitioned President Andrew Johnson to pardon the man. He wrote, He inspired the hopeless with courage, and by his constant presence in the midst of danger and infection, regardless of his own life, tranquilized the fearful and desponding. 299 other officers and soldiers signed the petition as well. Then, in February of 1869, Mrs. Sarah Mudd received a letter at her home in Maryland from a United States government courier whom she greeted at the same infamous door where Booth had appeared four years before. The letter read, Dear Mrs. Mudd, As promised, I have drawn up a pardon for your husband, Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. Please come by my office at your earliest convenience. I wish to sign it in your presence and give it to you personally. Sincerely, Andrew Johnson, President of the United States of America. Sarah Mudd had never given up hope that her husband would return home. Petitioning and visiting the President personally numerous times since her husband's imprisonment began. And now, he would finally be released after three years and seven months at Fort Jefferson. So on March 8, 1869, Dr. Samuel Mudd boarded a steamer named Liberty and returned home to Maryland, where he'd continue to practice medicine, rebuild the family farm, and father five more children with his wife Sarah. Construction of Fort Jefferson had gone on for more than 30 years. But once the Civil War had come to a close, its usefulness 
and practicality began to waver. So in 1874, the War Department made the decision to pull its troops, leaving only a small caretaker force behind. The unfinished complex was used intermittently over the years, and in 1935, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt designated it a national monument. The entire stretch of islands would eventually follow suit, and in 1992, the Dry Tortugas became a national park. Now, over a century and a half since construction began, Fort Jefferson still stands on Garden Key, the largest 19th century masonry fort still standing in America. But unfortunately, it's its legacy as an abandoned prison that overshadows its military might. After all, not once were the guns of Fort Jefferson fired, yet death and tragedy ran rampant through its walls. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast with all content and music written and produced by Brandon Schecksneider. Editorial and research assistance from Brianne Schecksneider. To keep up with future episodes, subscribe today on Apple's podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. Lucky Little Shacks.